Thank you, Linda. Go. Yes, God and your bod, part two. Bit of fun. No mole birds in the house. I think Tam's happy with that. Linda, if yeah, you can help me with my table, that would be great as well. Frill. Sorry? Brilliant. Um, Got a new bod, part two. I have a box of what the kids will know as the box of mystery, um, or just a box of fun things because toys are fun. <laughs> um, but no, that's all right. Very cool. Um, welcome. My name is Daniel. For those of you in the room, it's a pleasure to see. For those of you online, it's a pleasure to have you with us for God in Your Bod, part two. As we explored this series, Jeremy preached last week talking about the fact that God has made us. God has made us who we are. God has made us in our entirety. And Jason, um, in communion, used or referenced the scripture that we are not our own, that we are bought at the price, that our bodies belong to God. So last week, Jeremy talked about the physical aspects of it and the fact that we are human beings, that we are bodies, we only have one body, we can't trade in. Um, and coming into this week, um, heading down a slightly different aspect, talking about our mental health, talking about our mental physicality. And I know that there's a bit of um, potential dualism where we go, our bodies are physical, we can touch them and our minds are this weird you know, bundle of electrons and things that are happening over there, what's the deal? Um, but as we research and as we kind of investigate, there is such a powerful link between physically what's happening in our brains and our thought life. Um, there's really cool research um, over the last 10, 15 years around a gut-brain axis about what's happening in like our tummies and our intestines and the impact that that has on our mental health and our brains. And um, kind of it's a dualistic thing where our brain impacts our gut and our gut impacts our brain. And there's all this really cool research coming out at the moment about that. Um, so I want to kind of head into that direction or talk about mental health, um, talk about our minds, our thought life today. Um, as some of you will know, or many of you will know, I come from the background of teaching. Um, I come from a space of where psychology was something that I studied at university, it's something that I've taught in classrooms, and the thing that I love about it is that what the world is starting to understand, what society and um, scientific inquiry is starting to investigate, many of those principles go back and connect through to what scripture says thousands of years ago. So, today I'm going to teach you a couple of scientific principles, and I've got bits that hopefully will remind you about them. So, I've got a mirror, I'll sit there, I've got a candle, and I have a nice little train tracky thing that can sit there as well. I know that if you're sitting in the room, you're thinking, Dan, what on earth are you doing? Why is there a mirror? What's the deal with the candle? Why have you raided the preschool room, the missing part of that train tracks? What's happening? Um, and 100% it is from our Clubhouse program, um, but hopefully they'll survive without a couple of blocks of track. Um, but we're, we're going to talk a little bit about mirror neurons, a little bit about um, fire, um, and a little bit about tracks and brain tracks. And it'll make sense, I promise, by the end of today. Um, but before we dive any further, would you join me in prayer? Hey, God, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you love to speak to your people, and God, that you do it through lots of different ways. God, we thank you that you speak through worship and through music, through lyric. Father God, we thank you that you speak through revelations as we drive down the road. Father, we thank you that you speak through communion and the fact that we stop and we pause and we remember the sacrifice of your son, his death and his resurrection. And Father, I pray that today as we spend some time digging into your word, Father God, that you would continue to reveal yourself. God, we pray that you would be speaking so loudly and God, that we would have the attentiveness to hear what you are saying. Have your way today. Amen. Now, before I get into this, I want to tell you a little bit, a little bit of a story, a little bit that may fall off, that's all right, a little bit of a story, a little bit of um, something that I used to do. I was chatting to someone, actually, 
last week about um, this thing. And then my mum was sending me messages this week. I'm like, okay, we'll bring that in. Um, so I, years ago, um, I was a scout. I did scouts for 12 years. I was, I think, six years old when I started. I was 18 when I kind of graduated out of the final age program. And um, in year 12, things kind of shuffled around a bit. Um, but one of the things that I loved to do in scouts is I used to love going hiking. Um, and one of the places that um, I went hiking lots was Wilson's Promontory. It's down in the south end of Victoria. Um, it has the southernmost point of mainland Australia. It's absolutely beautiful. I think I've hiked every single possible track that there is in that area, um, in the prom. And one of the places, or one of the first um, tracks that I did was Mount Oberon. And there's a picture that's about to pop up of the sign that kind of points out to Mount Oberon. Mount Auburn, it's a pretty, it's, it's not that bad of a walk. Um, it's 3.4 k's, it's about an hour from base camp up to the summit. Um, it's, it's a fairly nice walk, um, you get to see lots of things, it's really pretty. Um, and the first time I did Mount Oberon, I was about 11 years old, I reckon. Um, about 11, 11 or 12. And I was on this hike, we had a little day pack, and I was going for this walk. Um, and it was this beautiful track. Next picture. Thing about Mount Oberon is it, it is a mountain, as the name would indicate. Um, it is this hill, and you know, I know that in Shep we don't particularly have a whole heap of inclined planes and hills going on, but Mount Oberon, there, there's a bit of this kind of hill going on, and it starts off nicely. It starts off with a fa fairly well-constructed road, um, and as you travel along, the path starts to get narrower. And if you've ever driven up a mountain or if you've ever hiked up a mountain, um, at least the nice ones, the paths, instead of going straight from the bottom, vertically up to the top, they, they kind of do this meandering. They kind of do this winding path. Um, and there's these series of kind of switchbacks, and that's my next picture. And what I found about half an hour into this hike, between me and my mates, we went you know what, it was really fun at the car park. And it was really exciting when we could see the top of the mountain that we wanted to walk to. And it was really fun for the first kind of 10 minutes walking around and seeing the different trees and seeing all the different bits of nature. But every time we got up to this switchback or to the next one before it turned around, we went, oh, we must be nearly at the top. And then we'd get to it and we'd turn and realise there was a whole other path and we didn't know the, where the end of that was. And it was this thing, I remember having this conversation with a mate on going, how many of our mates do you reckon have actually made it to the top of Mount Oberon? If we just took photos and went, yeah, yeah, at the top there's heaps of trees around and this is what it looked like, and just kind of use those photos, would that pass as, yeah, we made it to the summit? And there was this debate on should we keep going, should we not? Should we keep working our way and plodding on and kind of we've had this conversation or we've heard already today about you know, the, the importance of the persistence of continuing and taking the next step and moving on. Um, we had this discussion. But as we persisted and as we continued, eventually, probably a little bit more than an hour, eventually we did make it to the summit and the summit is absolutely beautiful. It's totally not what the trees look like. I'll flick, flick across to the next picture. Um, it is absolutely beautiful. You kind of, at the top of Mount Oberon, you can see, you look up north and you see Tidal River and you see the base camps. You kind of get to view across Risky Bay and across Telegraph and out across to um, Sealers in the east. And it's this beautiful place. It's absolutely breathtaking. I haven't been in about 15 years. I want to go back. <laughs> but what, what motivated us or what kept us going was keeping in mind what that end result was. Keeping in mind that we knew that we could make it. We knew that um, we were equipped. We knew that we had the equipment for it. We had the sustenance. We had the energy to do it. And even though it was hard at times, even though we you know, got round one corner and went, oh, there's more trees, and another path, and more trees, and another path, and more trees. The reminder to keep our goal in mind was there. And what I want to talk today is kind of a little bit backwards um, about keeping the end in mind. Keeping the end in mind. Keeping in mind that there's a really pretty summit that we can get to. And even if the journey is long, 
even if we feel like we've had that fog that's rolled through. Turn the lights on, keep journeying through. Even if we've got stones in our boots, that's all right. Step off the path, take the boot off, tip out the stones, chuck the boots on, keep walking, because there's a promise of what is to come. And I was thinking and praying about going, God, what do you want to say today, or what, what is this message about? There's 10 different ways that we could have gone. Um, but the statement that I came back to, and I think if this has been in our newsletter, it's been on our communications, on our Insta or Facebook, um, is this phrase that, this series, we're going to be talking about what it means in practical terms to honour God. What it means in practical terms to honour God. And taking that, that's the journey that I want to go on today. We're going to similarly meander through the Bible. I'm going to be flicking through to lots of places. Don't get a paper cut. Um, but we're going to be going, what does it mean to honour God? And then what do we need to do to get there? So our first scripture that I want to head to is in Matthew chapter 7. And if you've got your Bibles, flick across. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. And in this Bible, the title of this little paragraph is The Narrow and Wide Gates. What it means to honour God. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 14 says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And this verse, for the last couple of weeks, has been popping up again and again in my life through conversation. It's been challenging. I've been chatting with young people around this about what does it look like? What does God call us to do? What is the life that honours God? What is that narrow road? I think if we do that big picture, that zoom out, what does God call us to do? What is an honouring life? An honouring life is to live by the narrow road. It's to choose to follow him when life gets tough. It's choosing to do good things, as you know, we talked about in Kids Club this, uh, this Tuesday. In youth group on Saturday, we had that same conversation about doing good, about choosing to live a life that honours God. I find that really cool, just how God's been kind of dropping this time and time again. But what is the narrow road? That's my next question. And again, we're kind of working through this in kind of a backwards logic thing. If, we, if God calls us to honour him by following the narrow road, what is it? And Romans chapter 12, I think, says this well. So flick across a little bit through the Gospels, pass Acts into Romans. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, be holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. And verse 2, this is where we head to in our world when we're talking about mental. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If we talk about the fact that we're called to walk this narrow road, the only way that we're going to understand what is the narrow road, the only way that we're going to understand what God calls us to do is to go through this process, to be renewing our minds, be constantly, daily renewing our minds, transforming into what God calls us to be. Because as we do so, it says that we're able to approve and to test what God's will is. We're able to see what is that good, that pleasing, that perfect will that he calls us to do. And in Hebrews um, 12, I told you if we're flicking around a little bit today. I'll flick across. Hebrews 12, um, verses 2 to 3, says this. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for who... Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I want to kind of tie those three concepts together. We are called to walk upon a narrow road. 
How do we understand what is the will of God? We do it by renewing our minds daily. And what does that look like? It looks like fixing our eyes on Christ. It looks like focusing on him. And a couple of weeks ago, I know Linda preached about Christ, our cornerstone, and she had different boxes and the fact that our entire faith is meaningless without understanding the importance of Christ. And what I love is I'm going to jump into my first thing now, a mirror. There's this really cool thing in psychology at the moment. I'm going to try and blind someone. I don't know. There you go. If, if, if I aim for Linda right there. Um, is that blinding anyone if I put it there? It should I think it's winning up. There we go. I can see it on the tile on the roof. Um, there's this really cool concept about new mirror neurons. Um, and mirror neurons um, is this fascinating thing where basically um, scientists have put on EEGs, they've put on technology to measure where brain activity is happening. Um, and in individuals who watch an action, the parts of their brain that activate are the same as the individuals who perform the action. So, for example, um, they, they looked at a basketballer who is practicing doing a layup um, and the parts of his brain that activated as he physically did that. And then they got him in a room and made him sit down and watch someone else perform that same thing and mapped his brain. And the same parts of his brain activated as if he were physically doing it. They've done this with pianists or with musicians. They've done this with a whole heap of different physical skills. And what they find is that by watching someone or by watching something happen, that the same parts of our brain, they mirror and they're activated. And when we go to scripture that says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, it says that we need to be looking at Jesus. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus because as we focus on him, our brains are mapping to what he does. I think that's really cool. It's a really dangerous thing about that as well because if we watch bad things, if we focus on negative things, our brains are doing that as well. Now, the scriptures where Jesus says that if you, it says in the Old Testament, do not murder, but if you have anger in your heart... Uh, it's the same thing. Or if you look at a woman lustfully, it's the same as if you've committed adultery because your mirror neurons are activating. Your brain is doing that thing, whether you're physically there or not. Mirror neurons, keep our eyes fixed on God. I think there's, yeah, there's a couple of pictures that will pop up, but that's all right. Um, Neuronal activity is excitational. It's what we call neuro, neuronal excitation. Um, the next picture, I, I just laughed because I'm like, this is the most exciting picture for you, um, which is just an electoral excitation graph. Um, I found it funny, and I thought it was exciting. Anyway, um, moving on. Sorry, that, that is a flop. Um, so what does it practically mean? What does it practically mean to honour God in terms, uh, in terms of honouring God with our bodies? If we keep our eyes, if we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, practically what does that look like? Because I think it's really easy to say, yeah, fix your eyes on Jesus, but if we look around it, there is no physical Jesus to look at. You can look at a cross, but you know, our cross is empty because we know that Jesus has come off the cross, that he's raised, he's resurrected, he's ascended to heaven. So what do we do? Where do we fix our eyes? And I love in the Psalms at the start of Psalm chapter 1, Right at the very beginning, it says this. So I flick past Job. Back through. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or does not sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither. Whatever he does prospers. I want to focus on that in verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord. He meditates on it day and night. And again, it brings on this renewal, this constant repetitive act, doing again and again and again, meditating on the things of God. Meditating on the word of God, meditating on his scriptures, meditating on what God has said. And again, I go, okay, cool, but what does that look like? 
We'll step it back again, another practical element, um, Philippians 4, verse 8. Back into the New Testament. Again, don't get a cramp, be flicking through. I don't know. I've got students who are writing essays at the moment and their hands are cramping up because they haven't practiced um, a physical thing. So it's been a while since I've physically flicked through a Bible. Philippians 4 verses 8 says this. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. I'll read that list again. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When we meditate on the Lord, when we focus on him and what he's doing, these are the things that we can focus on. Practically, what does it look like? It looks like this. It looks like identifying in our world the things that are true. For all truth is God's truth. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. It means that we exalt or we we focus on, we celebrate when someone does an act that is noble. It means that we choose to do the right thing even when it's hard or even when it hurts us. It means that we choose to focus on the admirable, sorry, Yeah, the admirable thing, or that which is excellent, that which is praiseworthy. When's the last time that you congratulated someone? When's the last time that you went, hey, you know what? When you did that thing, that's worthy of being praised because that's God acting through you. Think about such things. The next um, psychological principle I want to teach you I got a candle. I wanted to set it on fire, but I thought against it because I, I don't trust myself, um, is the short answer. Um, but there's this phrase in psychology, and if you've, Zach will have learnt it, um, if you've done VCE psych, um, you will have heard this phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And all it means is, it's a fancy term, it's rhymy, so the science community's happy, it's easy to remember, um, is that if you have a thought pattern or a brain track through your brain that you keep using, then that's going to become stronger. It's going to be easier to do that. Again, if we take the basketball analogy, if the first time that you're trying to take a shot, you're probably not going to do amazingly. If you take that shot 10,000 times, it's going to be ingrained into your body. You're going to be able to do it naturally. Neurons that fire together, why together? And what that teaches us, again, going back to scripture, is that as we focus on that which is true and lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, the more often we do it, the more often we keep our eyes on God and focus on him and go and do what he has called us to do, the easier it becomes, the more natural it becomes, the better we can naturally identify where God is in the midst of our situations, whether it's at home or at work or at school or out in the park or whatever else that we're doing. The more that we focus on the things of God, the easier it is to do that and the healthier it is to live a life that God has called us to live. You know, that why together, why together. The last thing that I want to acknowledge is that sometimes starting a new practice, choosing to try and focus on the good, choosing to try and focus on the lovely, the admirable, the praiseworthy, excellent, and all those other things can be really hard. A new habit is really hard. If anyone has ever tried to start a new thing on, you know, um, at the start of the year, it's really hard. Most habits that we say that we're going to start tend to fade out in the first couple of weeks of January, um, if we're honest with ourselves. And while some of it is persistence and pushing through, sometimes we need to acknowledge that it's not just about creating a new habit, but it's about choosing to stop an old habit first. Ephesians chapter 4. This is one of my favourite scriptures um, that whenever I talk about, people kind of look at me blankly and like, why are you saying this, Dan? Because it sounds obvious, and what's the deal? Um, Ephesians chapter 4, and the verse by itself... Um, where are we? 
is verse 28, and then we'll read it in context. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says, He who has been stealing must steal no longer. I'm like, duh. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on, Paul, give me something more profound. He who is stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. There's this notion of stop and start. I want to read kind of a larger portion of scripture to give us some context in that. Um, Paul is telling um, the church in Ephesus, he's writing to these guys about what does it look like to live a holy life? And from verse 22, it says this, you were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, but instead to be made new in the attitudes of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you stir angry and do not give the devil a foothold. He who, must, who, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come from your mouth, but only what is helpful for the building up according to their needs, that it may be a benefit to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice but instead be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Again, there's that beauty of focus on the beautiful things, focus on the things of God, get those neurons to fire together, to wire together, but the acknowledgement that it's not just do good things, do good, do good, do good. Stop the bad stuff. Stop the bad stuff. So stop to start. And for many of us, or I know when I have conversations with young ones and teens, a lot of the media that they're consuming, a lot of the podcasts that they're consuming um, are not particularly focusing on the things of God, are not particularly healthy things. Um, the true crime podcasts um, over the last few years, I do not understand them, but have gone up. They've become one of the most popular genres um, of podcasts to be listening to that have downloaded and listened to on a daily basis where people go, I'm going to listen about how someone murdered other people or how someone went on a murdering spree and how they have cops haven't found them. Um, not my thing, I find it weird, but I know statistically that that's something that has gone on the increase post-COVID, actually, or during COVID, where people started listening in to all these different things. If God calls us to think about the lovely, the beautiful, the admirable, the excellent and praiseworthy, it's about stopping filling our minds with the rubbish as well. The last kind of scientific principle or um, psych world that I want to head to um, is this thing called brain tracks. Brain tracks and off-ramps going to just have a play. I'm like, that's probably not appropriate. Um, but brain tracks and off ramps. Um, and again, it, it kind of goes off this concept of neurons that wire together, fire together, or fire together, wire together, where we can create an automatic response. We create this automatic response that when this happens, this is how I respond to the situation. Some of those are really good. If something's flying at our face, we're probably going to blink or shield our face. It's an automatic response. It's a track that's kind of been blazed through and it's this really easy path to walk down. We create these brain tracks to generally for self-preservation or that get us in a habit of doing something really well. And for the guys who have done Valiant Man, um, encourage the course, this is something that we talk about. The fact that we create habits that are really positive. But what it also means is that we can create some really negative brain tracks. McDonald's works really hard that if, to create a brain track in your mind that if you're driving from Shep down to Melbourne, if you're driving past Wallen, there is a brain track in your brain that's trying to activate that says, you need to pull over and get a frozen Coke. And if you choose to do that, every time you drive from, Melbourne down to she uh, from Shep down to Melbourne and you pull into Wallen, you're developing a brain track that says, I need to go over, I need to stop, I need to get myself a frozen Coke, and it becomes easier and easier and easier to do. 
We have brain tracks all in our lives. If I'm feeling upset, I may have a brain track that I practice and repeat where I'm going to my second drawer in my office and pulling out a block of chocolate. If I have a brain track in my life, it might be I'm getting really angry at someone, I'm going to choose to respond in that anger. You might have a brain track in your life that says, I'm feeling kind of lonely right now, I'm going to jump on my phone to find some sort of entertainment where I feel fulfilled. We all produce these, create these brain tracks. And what the challenge is, is to create off-ramps. If you found yourself that you're caught in a place, in, a, in, in this rhythm where you can't break out of an unhealthy habit, it's about creating an alternative track. It's about creating an alternative route that actually is going to stop you from ending in a dangerous place. I think it was a 2010 paper, potentially, um, that first came up with these three terms, stop, challenge, choose. It's been a concept that I found so profound, it's on a little post-it note on my computer, mainly when people call me who I get angry with. And I have to have this moment where, hey, Dan, how are you going to respond to this person who might be kind of crying on the phone? If someone's angry at you, or if someone's angry at me, my first response is probably to get angry back. If someone's being annoying, I'll probably not treat them the nicest. But to challenge that, to stop in that moment. Challenge where is my brain naturally going versus where do I want it to go? Where has God called me to go? And to choose to make that good action. And what we find neurons that fire together, wire together, if they stop firing, if we stop going down that route, the, the, there's actual physical, like, neuronal networks that dissolve. And that brain track dissolves. It takes time, but there, there's, like, physical chemistry in your brain where um, it's GABA. Um, there, there's these chemicals that release that track over time. We stop, we challenge, and we choose to follow the things of God. And sometimes that's all it is. Sometimes to get healthy mentally is about doing the hard yards and choosing to stop, to challenge, to choose that option. And sometimes there's stuff that psychology can't teach us. Sometimes if there's unhealthy mind thoughts or brain patterns or whatever it is, if there's a thought life that tries to pull us down, sometimes the solution to that is spiritual warfare. And we want to acknowledge that, you know, that scientists teach us so much, and I love it, it's so fascinating, but that some things in this world that we can't explain by science. And there's this element of spiritual warfare that were required, that may be required. Ephesians chapter 6 reminds us of this. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to flick through. You should hopefully still be in Ephesians 4, so 6 is, may just be across the page. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our challenge sometimes is more than just a physical thing. And while it might manifest in our brains as something that is a mental problem or a mental challenge, we need to acknowledge that if we're choosing or if we've opened ourselves up to something spiritual that is not of God, if um, we've been in a situation, if there's family things that have come through, that sometimes the solution is a spiritual solution. And again, I was last week having a conversation with someone who was presenting in a way that most psychs would go, hey, there's some sort of chemical imbalance in this brain, but it was manifesting as a spiritual issue. And we acknowledge that, and as a church, we acknowledge that spiritual is significant and spiritual has impact on the world around us. Ephesians 6, um, 12 tells us that, that our fight isn't against flesh and blood, but against what's happening in the spiritual realms. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 says that weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world, but they have divine power. Um, and there's kind of scriptures there that feed into this idea. So what do we do? Finishing off Ephesians 6, um, Paul says this. 
Therefore, in light of all of this, in light of the fact that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, verse 18 says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Starting point is prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, pray continually or pray continuously in all situations. We go to it. Ephesians 6, um, some of you will know that that passage talks about the armour of God and it says, take up the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. This is our solution. So what does it mean? What does all of this mean practically? What does it mean to oh, practically honour God in terms of, oh, to, in terms of honouring God with our bodies? Um, as we move on, I want to kind of go into these four practical steps. I think I should have slides that will follow us there as well. So practical step number one, mirror neurons. Keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Ultimately, what is the goal? God calls us to honour him. How do we do it? By keeping our eyes fixed on him. He calls us to focus on him because we know that as we look at Christ, our lives become like him. Practical step number two, if that's too nebulous of an idea, number two, think about such things. If anything is excellent or worthy, praiseworthy, think about such things. Our neurons that fire together, why together? The more that we train our brains to focus on the things of God instead of focusing on the other things around us, the more that we can do this. There's an old song that's, or old hymn that says, um, to turn our eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But sometimes to get to that point, to even choose, that when we try and choose to focus on God, there's things that get in the way. So practically, if there's stuff in your life that you go, I want to do this, I want to be focusing on God, I try to focus on what is true and excellent and worthy and um, admirable and all those other things, but I just can't, maybe for you, a practical step is to stop something before you start something. Stop something before you start something. Like I said, when I was um, on those hikes, if we got a rock in our boot... We weren't going to just march on and try and keep hiking and develop a massive blister in our boot. We'd stop. You sit on the side of the road, you pull out that rock. But that doesn't solve the issue if you just sit on the side of the road. Chuck the boot back on, and as Tam said, keep driving, keep on going through. Stop something to start something. For others of you, it might not be a physical thing. It might be a spiritual thing. And that comes to a point of spiritual warfare. Are you willing to get on your knees and pray? Are you willing to do the effort and do the work that it takes to find freedom so that we can fix our eyes, so that we can focus on God, and so that we can fix our eyes on Christ? I want to spend some time praying into these different things. And um, if I can get band to come up and play as well, that would be great. I want to spend some time praying about these things. And if you find that this is something that you identify with, if you find that this is something that you want prayer for, um, I will pray that we are able to fix our eyes. I'll pray that we can focus on what is good, that we can stop and start, and that we'll pray into a space of spiritual warfare and head into that space. If you, at any of these points, identify with that and go, yep, this is me, I'd love you to stand up as we pray. So the first one, if you um, want to be fixing your eyes on Christ, if you find that that's something that is a call to you, that you know what, in my life, in my world right now, I need to actually turn my eyes to God. I need to stop focusing on the situations around me and getting caught up in that because that leads to anxiety spirals or depression cycles and that, that's really not a healthy space. If that's something that you want to head into or that you would love prayer for, um, you can identify that. I know for me, (laughs) that's our goal. That's my life, to look like Christ, for my brain to reflect on Christ. So if that's something, I'll pray for that. It might be someone online as well. Hey, God, uh, thank you that you make yourself accessible. Thank you that you are not a God who cannot be seen, but God, that you call us to focus on you. God, we thank you that you desire restorations for our minds. 
And God, that we, as we fix our eyes on you, God, that we become just that little bit more like you and go from holy to holy. Father God, for those of us who, who there's something within us that we want to desire to fix our eyes on you, to look up at you instead of being caught up by the things around us. Father God, may you give us that strength to focus on you, to have our eyes upon you. And God, for us who, who know that while filling our worlds potentially with things that are not so lovely, that are not so admirable, not so pure, not so noble, not so excellent or trustworthy. Father, we repent for the times where we haven't focused on the things of you, where we've sold out for the cheap car seats and we've been burnt in the process. God, help us to focus on you and what you have called us to do. May we see you in our everyday lives. May we see your beauty in creation. May we see it in the family members that we so easily get angered with and can say stuff not particularly in love. But God, may you reveal your beauty, your admirable, your loveliness, your excellence. May we focus on the things that are praiseworthy. May we vocalize that. Father, for those of us who have stuff in our lives that we need to stop doing before we can even think about starting to worship you. God, give us the strength and the courage to, to have a conversation with someone about this. God, it's so much easier to be able to start a new habit if someone keeps us accountable, if we're having conversations with others who can gather around us. So God, for us in this room right now who, who have that conviction, who feel that reminder of you going, yeah, that thing that you're doing, you need to stop that. And it's not because you're a God who isn't fun. It's not because you're a God who wants to take away our joy, but you're a God who knows us intimately and knows what is best for us. You're a God who doesn't want us to be caught up with the fake things, the, the knockoffs, the dodgy things. But God, you desire our lives to be filled with beauty. You desire for our lives to be filled with excellence. And God, that means that we need to stop doing the things that would try and fill in those spaces. God, for us that, whether it be personally for ourselves or whether it be for someone that we love dearly, a family member, a friend, that we choose to stand in the gap for, that we choose to pray for, that we acknowledge that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rules and authorities and spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. God, we thank you that you are bigger than anything the enemy can throw at us. <laughs> God, we thank you that your power is greater than anything. So when we come to spiritual warfare, God, that we are on the winning side. We thank you that we can trust in you. We thank you that we can pray. And God, that the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. Have your way today, O oh Lord stand in the gap for those who need interceding. We pray on their behalf. Have your way, O oh Lord. Thank you that you're powerful, that you are mighty, that you are in control, O oh Lord. Help us honour you in all that we do. Honour you practically with our lives, with our bodies, with our minds, with all that we think and act and say and do. We honour you, O Lord. In your name we pray. Yours, we give it unto you. We give it to you, O Lord. Have your way, we pray. In your name. Amen.
Hey, if you would love prayer for anything discussed or anything else in your week, feel free to come down front. We've got people who would love to pray for you. Otherwise, feel free to head off um, into the foyer for morning tea. Have a conversation. What does it look like? Talk, tell someone something that's lovely or beautiful, admirable, trustworthy that you've seen this week. Or if you need to have a chat with someone about a choice that you're going to make to stop doing something, have that conversation as well. God bless and have a wonderful day.